Hey, welcome to today's live stream. We're doing this a little earlier than normal this week. Uh, it is Sunday, the 9th of May, Mother's Day. I, I Actually, I didn't even think about this. Uh, I'm streaming on Mother's Day. I wonder if we're going to get as, as many people. It looks like there's already a, a couple dozen of you tuning in. Welcome. Hey, shout out in the comments where you are uh, tuning in from. Wilson's here. Jolo Puki too. I know you're in Latvia. That is so cool. Uh, Bobby Boldy. Yeah, we're, we're going to be, we have a few um, interesting topics I'm going to be talking about with uh, my guy at my local AD. <laughs> he's he's awesome. I'm going to introduce him properly here in a minute. Uh, we got Scott Wexlin here uh, tuning in from Westchester, Pennsylvania. We've got someone, uh, Ken Bob 250 coming in from Glendale, California, Belgium. Thomas is uh, tuning in from Belgium. And it's so great. I'm always amazed at how varied the locations are for everyone tuning in. Uh, Switzerland, Lama Ludwig from Switzerland. That is really awesome. <laughs> Lama Ludwig, what a name. That is a great name. All right, guys, let, let's start. Uh, let's kind of just jump into it here uh, real quick. I am going to be flying to Pennsylvania close to Scott. I'm leaving tomorrow. I'm going to be filming at Brento Miller Jeweler in Lancaster, Pennsylvania on Tuesday and Wednesday. We're having a watch enthusiast meetup on Wednesday evening at the store at the authorized dealer. Someone from France tuning in and the UK, Somerset, the UK, man. Hey, first time Stan is in the house. Uh, good to see you, man. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to be, I'm going to be doing that. I'm really excited to do that trip, travel, film some awesome watches, meet as many of you as, as can attend. I know there's probably going to be a couple dozen of you in attendance. So, uh, Joe Lapuki too, you are too kind. You are too kind. Thank you. Uh, but let, let me introduce my guest. I, I know you guys probably understand this feeling. You have normal friends and then you have watch friends uh, that you meet either on local get-togethers, forums, Facebook groups, YouTube sections, different channels. And sometimes, at least in my experience, sometimes your watch associates, your watch friends become real friends. And when you get together, you don't even talk about watches half the time. You're talking about life and other things. And uh, hey, first time from, uh, from UK. Good to see you, Simon. So uh, that's what's happened with me with John. He was an authorized dealer salesman that sold me my GMT Master II. What was that, like three years ago now, four, three and a half years ago. And he's become a, a good friend of mine. So I'm pleased to announce him. Uh, we're going to be talking about the luxury watch market from the authorized dealer perspective. And I'm looking forward to this chat. But as always, guys, I've put together a little intro for John and uh, let me play it right now. Welcome, John. How you doing, man? Hey, Bruce. I'm doing great. How are you today? Awesome. It's good to see you as always. What are you wearing today? What's on your wrist? Huh, so today I'm wearing uh, Panerai 1312. Um, it's my only Panerai, but um, just thought I'd mix it up today and throw it on. And, Heck yeah. Uh, I'm excited to have it on. So. So I got a few clips from that intro from that watch when you let me borrow it. So I'm familiar yeah, I with that fifties case. That's a lovely piece. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Hey, let's, let's jump into this. Uh, let, let me kind of introduce, I, I want to make one thing clear. I just realized this Federico from Federico talks watches partners with a guy named John P who talks <laughs> watches has his own channel. I wonder, so yeah, Joe Lopuki uh, was expecting John P from, from uh, Fred, you know, of, of Federico Talks Watches Association. And this is a different John P. This is my, my local friend, John P, who works at my authorized dealer. And uh, you guys are exclusive with Paddock, Rolex, Omega, Tudor, IWC, Cartier, and Hermes, right? Those are the brands. And Breitling. And Breitling, I miss. Yes. Oh, but you're not exclusive with Breitling. There's another. No, that's uh, true. There is another dealer, but I love. But Breitling. all the other ones that you are the only place in the state of Utah to get those watches. So yes, and and, yeah. and I will say I, I know there is the other John P. I promise you guys, I'm hopefully equally as cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. But. So this is a different John P. Uh, but hopefully, I can get the other John P. on here at another time. That would be a lot of fun. Sure. But yes, this is a. This is uh, John Polson, 
Uh, you are an avid hunter, fisherman, golfer, entrepreneur, student, Jeep enthusiast, authorized. You got a lot of titles, man. It's just nice to have you here. Yeah, I'm basically Utah in a nutshell right there for you. <laughs> hey, Richard says, this is John P., Rolex dealer, Paddock. Enough said. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Yeah. Hey, let, let's, let me put up a, a ticker here. I want to hear your opinion, John. How has it been working at an authorized dealer? How, how have you noticed the luxury watch scene with the brands we just mentioned? And specifically, how has it changed within the last five years? From the authorized dealer salesman's perspective, give us a rundown you know, from your point of view. Yeah. So I'll preface this by saying like, I, I am one of the luckiest people out there. I used to work in the golf industry and I just kind of somehow, long story short, got into the watch industry. And I can wake up every single day and go to work and I'm happy to go to work. And I consider that a huge blessing because I get to talk with cool people like yourself and a lot of your viewers. And I get to, um, you know, yeah, have we, the, we yeah. have a local guy here real quick. Jim Little hey, is tuned in. Jim Little, how you doing? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Can continue. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. So when I, when I first started, I started working at a Rolex boutique in Salt Lake city. And, um, you know, I learned, I learned about Rolex, learned to love the brand and appreciate the quality of it. Um, back when I started, you guys may not believe this, but we had Hulks in the case. We had Batmans in the case. And I, and I had a hard time selling these watches. <laughs> I was like, no, I don't. And people were saying, I don't want a green watch. I don't want a, a dual <laughs> colored bezel GMT master two. Um, I remember we had, you know, uh, the green dial John Mayer Daytona sitting there. I vividly remember I, I would talk to people about it. I was like, guys, this is a great watch. You should get this while it's here. And no, no, what kind of discount can I get on it? And we, we don't do any kind of discounting like that, but it's just kind of funny how, how I've watched it change from me, you know, begging people to buy these watches and trying my best to get them to buy it. People would, yeah. but now it's just, you know, and well, not impossible, but extremely different, extremely hard to get these pieces. Yeah. Um, you have no role. You have no Hulks. You have no John Mayers. You, you're not uh, yeah. trying to, Hey, experience this awesome watch. Cause me and you were watch twins. You, you have a Hulk that you got years and years ago yeah. back when nobody wanted the Hulk. Nobody wanted the green watch. You got one. Yeah, when when I when I bought it, uh, some of my friends said, "Why would you buy that ugly green watch?" And I was like, "I like the color. I like the watch." Um, and that's you know, like I'm you, you have one on your display there. Um, so I yeah, you know, and I got, I got mine it. when everybody wanted it. So the opposite of you. So yeah, you got yours. What right right when the earthquake happened here or something like that? A couple yeah, of it, years was, ago. Uh, it was it was St. Patrick's Day last year in 2020. Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. truly, you're truly blessed. I think that may have been one of the last Hulks that I've ever sold. So, yeah. um, but yeah, very, very interesting. And as, as frustrating as it can be, it truly is, um, a very, uh, amazing industry to be in. I feel very lucky to be part of it. So, so yeah, so Chilini is hard to see James. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you Especially guys have, a, you have a couple of Chilinis, don't you? Uh, we have a few Cellini times. A few of them were just discontinued, uh, but the Cellini Moon Phase is my favorite, and that's a very hard watch to get right now. I think that will be a great sleeper pick down the road. Yeah. So you basically, for me to try to sum up there what you said, when you first started, it was it was almost difficult to sell Pretty some much. watches. Yeah, and now it's absolutely the opposite. Yeah, anything you wanted five years ago, aside from the white dial and black dial Daytona with the ceramic bezel, we we could have gotten you for the most part. Yeah, yeah. and now obviously it's hard to get an Oyster Perpetual, right? You know, yeah, with the, the colorful dial. So, yeah. So, I mean, out of all the brands that you carry, I would assume Rolex is by far what people are inquiring about. But are there some other brands that are kind of hot at the moment? that you get a decent amount of inquiries on that you carry in the store. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have some fantastic brands. Um, probably three brands that, well, I guess two brands right now that 
you know, when people realize that Rolex is going to be tough to get and that, you know, me as a, I as a salesman trying to turn them, uh, get them into are uh, Breitling and Omega because those brands um, have an equally amazing history as Rolex and, in my opinion, produce an equally great quality watch for a great price. Um, so I'll always show them those. My favorite Breitling lately is the uh, Chronomat B01 with that new Rouleau bracelet. Um, and then Omega, on the other hand, I'm, I'm super excited to see the new Seamaster 300, the non-professional with the yeah. lollipop second hand. Um, we've had a lot of interest in that as well. So what, when are you expecting to get that? Cause I think Omega said like April, May is when they're going to start sending them out. Yeah, we haven't got any, um, yet. I know that Omega is taking care of their, um, internal boutiques first normally. So, uh, you know, we just learned that we won't be getting a Snoopy for a while and things like that. But, um, we should be, we should see them roll in towards the uh, end of spring, beginning of summer. I'm hopeful. Mm -hmm. So. Nice. But there is a, a healthy wait list for all those pieces too. So. <laughs> hey, Richard said, how long is the wait list for the Aquanaut? He managed to get on the list in the UK and was told <laughs> a six year wait. So tell us about that. Cause you sell paddock. I know you sell paddock. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's hard to put a timeline with these things. Um, we actually don't even really take names um, for these watches. We, we'll, we'll acknowledge your expression of interest, but Paddock is very, Paddock and Rolex are very rigid on that. They want us to sell only to local customers that we know and trust. Um, so that's good that you got on your list in the UK where, you, where that's your local dealer. Um, and we will take care of our people in, in Utah. Um, but then again, it's an extremely rare watch. Um, Paddock makes only, uh, I believe it's like 50 to 60,000 watches a year and that's, to, and that needs to feed the entire world. So they truly are amazing pieces. And I was going to talk about paddock actually. And, and later on this show, well, um, we, we can talk about it now, John. So, uh, tell me about paddock from your perspective, from selling it, what's interesting about it and what's it like selling paddock? Yeah. So I'm actually, um, in level, I just passed my level two training for Paddock Philippe and you actually need to be the level three in order to actually show them so or to sell them. So I, we do have our, uh, um, we have an amazing person at our, that knows all about Paddock and so authorizes, you know, do the full presentation that will oftentimes tag along with us, uh, with me. But um, Paddock is truly an amazing brand. I wanted to touch on, well, they have 10 values. Um, and I won't touch on all 10 of them, but I'll kind of go over my favorite ones that give you a good idea of what the brand's kind of like, right? Is that okay? No, absolutely. Yeah. So Paddock Philippe, um, one of the, one of the first other 10 values is quality and fine workmanship. And I don't know if, um, your viewers have ever, I'm sure many of them have, but have ever had the chance to come in and look at a Paddock Philippe, um, I wouldn't invite anyone in Utah to come check them out. I'd love to help to, to show you one. But, um, but um, the craftsmanship and the, when you hold one, it's, it's something different about it. You can tell that there's there, there's a, a sense of hand um, hand polishing and hand craftsmanship that go along with every paddock. Um, oh, you, were you going to say something, Bruce? No, it's just uh, some noticeable artistry. Like it's not just mass yeah. produced in a line. You can tell it's someone very talented assembled a very fine piece of, of luxury good, right? That's the feeling that you get with the paddock. Precisely. Yeah. Because ultimately, I mean, uh, a Seiko turtle and a paddock will do the same job, right? Which is keep the time and tell you the date. So then what's, what's the difference? Um, yeah. And, and that's where it, what comes into the, the material use and the, and the time it takes to be made and the quality of the, um, the movement and the, Oh, there's so many things to talk about. Uh, but a few things that I like about Paddock is that they, they keep alive many traditions that are no longer, you know, viewed as like popular or easy to do, which um, you'll notice on some Pateks where they'll do cl cloisonne, which is art with a uh, gold wire and they'll use it with enamel to make like the world time watch. It has that little world in the middle. Yeah. That's a very impressive watch to have a look and see. Uh, they'll use guilloche on those new Patek Colatravis that just came out with the hobnail bezels. That's guilloche, and that's done by hand. And if, if one thing's not right, too bad. Start over, right? Um, truly an amazing thing. They'll do hand engraving, uh, wood marquetry on some of their uh, rare handcrafts. 
you know, which take up to 400 hours just to create, you know, one dial of a wood marquetry. Yeah. Um, it's truly, truly amazing. But yeah. Oh, and, and I, and I will say that they are, they are one of the last family owned Geneva watchmakers. They are the last. Um, and that's truly, um, an amazing thing. They're vertically integrated, which means that they control the entire process from start to end. Um, they don't, you know, they don't have any shareholders telling them what to do. Same with Rolex. And I, and, and I don't, and I think that's part of the reason we can attribute their success to how amazing they are is because they are doing it for, you know, the true love of watchmaking and they're doing how, what they want to do without anyone outside telling them how to do it. Yeah. They don't make more watches to meet demand. They, you know, say we're going to make this many watches this year. We're going to do the best we can. And um, we understand that customers are frustrated, but you know, that's how we're going to do things. And I, and I respect that personally. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, Hey, we're going to discontinue by far our most sought after stainless steel sports model. Yeah. And we're going to do our own thing with it. We're going to make a green dial. Like yeah, I love it. Beautiful. They do not I care. It. Yeah, they so do great. not care. And, that, and that's why we are frustrated, but we love them. Right. Because we have to respect that. Yeah. So John, I also want to ask you, do you have a personal favorite brand or a personal favorite model and why? Because you see so many great watches. I mean, what speaks to you personally? Yeah. Um, so a little backstory for like your viewers that, you know, don't know me or didn't watch our watches and wings video, which was a great video, by the way. <laughs> right. I, we did. Hey, I got yeah. a shout out. If you're in Utah, I know Jim is in Utah. A couple guys local in the chat are local. We go to Trolley Wing Company and John introduced me to this place and uh, probably solely responsible for a good 10 pounds that I added <laughs> because yeah. it is so it's dang so good, good, man. Smoked wings and awesome appetizers yeah. and stuff. And yeah, yeah just we, kind of over there by Top Golf. If you're interested in coming, just let us know and we'll do our best to invite anyone. So, yeah. So All right. So, go ahead. You're in your backstory. <laughs> Yeah, so I I um, kind of got into watches a little more different than probably most people would. Um, my father's best friend um, was the Rolex rep back in like the early 2000s. And he introduced my dad to the world of watches and then consequently uh, got my, my father into a job with Panerai. So I was a young kid and I remember sitting with my dad and he, he just got the job of Hannah, right? And we would sit and memorize every single Pam number. There was a point where I could, I knew every single Panerai that was ever made and what number it was. I, I studied that brand inside and out. And I think it was a combination of, you know, making that connection with my father, as well as being so fascinated by a mechanical watch and how it works. The fact that, you know, quite simply just pieces of metal gears and, and springs that can work together to, cr to, you know, keep time and do other cool functions, um, always blew me away. Um, and, uh, so, so I, 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 I always had that connection and then I had got introduced into, um, possibly working in the watch industry by a, a girl I was dating a couple of years ago who was saying, John, you need to make, you need to make more money, have a career. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So she actually applied for me and long story short, I was very blessed and lucky to get the job uh, with OC Tanner at the Rolex boutique and the mall. Nice. Man. And, um, it just kind of blossomed from there. Um, and I'm, and I'm lucky. I feel like cause they often say to keep your career and your passion separate. And I do agree with that. But for some reason, this career and this passion have always been able to work for me. And That's I still great. wake up and excited to go. So what was your, I, did that answer your question? I don't even know the answer. I, I totally forgot the question. A favorite but, brand or favorite model? There we go. Sorry, Bruce. No worries, man. Uh, favorite brand, uh, Rolex and Panerai. My favorite model from Rolex is the GMT Master 2, BLRO 126710. That's um, the Pepsi. That is the Pepsi. Yep. Yeah. Um, the Jubilee. Uh, I don't think I'll get the oyster bracelet for it though, for a while. I like, I like the Jubilee. Yeah. Hey, let um, me ask you, I haven't asked you this before, but if you wanted to go into the precious metal realm, would you ever consider the meteorite dial Pepsi GMT master two? 
would I consider it? Yeah. Absolutely. Would I ever get it? Absolutely not. Because <laughs> <laughs> that is extremely hard to watch to get. Uh, but I do agree. It is one of the most beautiful watches. My friend calls it the space GMT or the space rock or something like that. I like that name, but I've never seen one. But I, I, the pictures I've seen, it's pretty watch. Really? Not yeah. one that's come into stock. That is wild. Very, hey, yeah, uh, very special, yeah. Stanley says he's interested in a Cartier tank. I'm Stanley, I'll message you. I can get you John's cell phone directly. Yeah. John, if you're okay with that. I love to help you, Stanley. Yep, absolutely. Do you, do you know if you have a, a tank in the uh, Park City store? Uh. It depends what tank he's in. The tank solo actually just got discontinued and are replacing it with the uh, different tank. Um, and those will be available in the summertime, but we'll talk and we'll figure it out. So Nice, man. Okay, so hey, let's take a question real briefly from Mr. French Fries Monster. Man, where do you guys come up with these names? These names <laughs> Mr. are French awesome. Fries sound good right now. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so uh, John is a dealer. What do you think of manufacturers? Should they? What should they do to bring back dress watches in demand rather than the sport watches that everybody wants. Uh, do you have an opinion on that? Yes. I mean, I wouldn't say that dress watches, dress watches are out of demand. I would say maybe a little bit this year, mainly because people aren't going out to events where a dress watch might be required. Um, we do sell a lot of Cellinis and a lot of Patek Philippe's and even like the Breitling Premier Heritages on the leather straps. I would consider that a dress watch. I uh, do very well. Um, but I, I do believe that social media is a culprit in the demand for these sport watches. Um, anyone here that has Instagram and I'm sure Instagram knows your uh, SE or your uh, who you are by now. So they're going to throw watches in your face all day long and all and if you're just seeing nothing but, oh, Daytonas and Nautiluses and uh, subs, Oaks and subs, do. yeah, you want that. But And that's great if you want that. I always try and talk to my customers and kind of ask them, get down to like the why they want that. Like, do you want that just because everyone else wants it or do you genuinely want it, right? And that's a fine line because I've known a lot of customers, especially early on when those sport watches were a little easier to get that would get the watch and they're like, I just don't love it. And I was like, well, you probably got it because you wanted to impress your, your boss or show off to your friends, but not because you actually wanted the watch. Whereas like with you, Bruce, when I first met you, did, 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 didn't you reach out like over email or something like that? I think I and probably got you did. The, yeah. I we got you the did. Air King and the, uh, yeah, I started with the GMT that, Master 2. Yeah, when when I would talk to you, I always felt confident in your decisions because you knew what you wanted, and that was. And I always knew that you, you know, would like those watches, even though I don't know if you have those watches still. But um, no, you know, you, know, I you are I still you, those. you are a man that you know knows what he wants. And as a, as a as a salesman, I feel much more comfortable selling that piece to someone that comes in for a specific piece, and rather than coming in and saying, "Do you have any stainless steel watches?" That's yeah, a red I'll take flag. Whatever I and can, I, yeah. and I will just yeah. No, I'm not going to touch that. I'm not going to deal with that. I have a hard time trusting that. So, yeah. Hey, uh, there's a couple questions. Let's let's hit here. Um, someone says, "Oh, where did it go?" Oh, okay. Here it is. Can you elaborate on the Omega Snoopy availability situation? I can elaborate. Yeah, I mean, uh, the new Snoopy, the cool watch. I think the back's cooler than the front, but. Um, you probably haven't the, uh, even seen one yet, I'm guessing. No, have not seen one, and I know that we will not see one this year. So I, uh, that's as much as I can elaborate on it. I don't know much more than that. Um, so I think your best shot is to contact an Omega Boutiques. Boutique. Yeah. Yeah. Boutiques. Omega seems to send the, the new stuff, the hot stuff there first before even – I mean, you might not ever even see one because we're a fairly small market, right, here in Utah? Yeah, we're, we're a smaller market. Me and my other partner and uh, other salesmen, we do our best to push to Omega and things like that. But um, we are small compared to, you know, America is a small market for Omega compared to Asia. I mean, Asia is where a lot of Omega is um, very popular. They have the second biggest market share in the world, I believe. Wow. And you wouldn't and you wouldn't guess that by coming into like an American Omega dealer, right? So 
I've also heard that it's it's not what the American market likes. Like we like Seamasters, Speedmasters. You go to an Asian yeah. market and Constellation's hot. Like Constellation's there's other mo- hot. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. The the Deville, the Constellation, Railmaster. I think the Railmaster is one of the greatest Omegas of all time, but uh, <laughs> that's just me. Hey, Carlo wants you to uh, show off your Pam. Oh, sure. So this Pam was a gift from my father to me and my twin brother and my brother-in-law. So here it is. It's a 1312. The new 1312s, if you're a Panerai guy, well, you will know has a solid case back, but this one actually has this uh, exhibition case back. This is the 9010 three-day movement. Um, and um, Time zone well, feature. Uh huh. And and one of, one of my favorite uh, things about this watch is on most on all Panerais is that they number their watches out of that that collection. So, uh, so I know in the year of you, which was 2018, I know that only 5,000 of this watch were made, and I have number so and so. So, that's a uh, pretty cool. To Sick. Me. Yeah. Hey, good afternoon to Dirk. Glad to see you, man. Dirk was just out here in Moab doing some off roading in an old Bronco. Wow. I'd be yeah. interested to know what trails you did. Cause I was just down there. But yeah. Hey, shout I it out. Dirk. If, what, yeah, what you know it, let me know. Did you hell's revenge? <laughs> uh, and then I also wanted to, I don't know if you can even answer this. You are perfectly welcome, John, to tell me to shove it. If I put a question up that you just don't want to touch, but sure. let's put this one up. How many Rolex sports models do eighties get in a year? I know um, it's really broad. You can shove it. No, I'm just kidding. It's very, <laughs> it, it's very few. Um, and they're, uh, every dealer is allocated now. So we can't just simply order a watch. Obviously Rolex knows that we want these watches. Um, it's very few. And I think it depends on the market size. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure that the bigger cities will get more and, and the smaller cities will get a little bit less, but that's just all I know. I, I really don't know much more than the, than the customer. I mean, like when you get stock, you're surprised. Like you're opening stuff and it's like, Oh, great. Now I can <laughs> try to sell this. Yeah. You don't know exactly what's coming in from what I understand. Correct. Yeah. We just, uh, like Christmas, you open it up and do what you can with it. So it's, uh, but we're very blessed to have, I feel very blessed to have Rolex as an authorized dealer. Very lucky. So, yeah. Hey, we've got a kind super chat from Stanley who says I was recently offered a white gold blue day date at my authorized dealer, which I turned down. Would that prevent me from getting other offered other Rolex in the future? Huh. Um, that's a great watch to be offered. Um, however, I, I think that, you know, they would respect that, that you would, you know, say, no, that's, I want something else and that you're more specific on that. Um, I can't comment on that specific AD and how they do their, their business. Um, but, uh, no, I don't think that would, uh, hurt your chances at all. I think that as long as you, have your salesman and you have a good relationship with them and you're open and honest and, uh, and patient. I think patient's the biggest one, then they'll, they'll respect that and, and, uh, good things will happen. So, yeah. Hey, let yeah. me tell a story here. This is, this is silly and I, and I get flack for this rightfully so, but it was about seven, eight months ago. You, John, you texted me and you said, Hey, do you want the, you, you ready for the turquoise OP? I was like, oh man, yeah. I just bought this overseas. I turned you down. I said no to the OP. <laughs> yeah, and I, and and I said you were a fool. No, I'm just yeah. kidding. No, that's uh, a that that watch is a, a beautiful, beautiful watch and very hard to get. But yeah. uh, no, I and I and I'm glad that you turned it down and went to someone else that equally wanted it as much and deserved it and uh, made their day and you had your bash on, which I just found out that you had sold on your last channel on your last video. Heck yeah, man. Are, yeah. are, are you hurt? Are you hurting a little bit? Any regret or no, yeah. no. See, I'm, I'm, I'm callous. I'm cold. I'm a lot different from the average watch fan because sure. I know, Hey, I'm going to let go of this lovely watch that I adore. <laughs> I would never have traded the experience for, but I can experience other watches that I really adore, really want to check out. Yeah. So for me, I love your, yeah. no, I, I'm not missing it. There might be, there might be some times here or there where I look at an old clip and I go, Ooh, yeah, I missed that watch, yeah. but you know what? I'll look at my wrist and then I'll go, oh, I'm good. You know, I've, I've got another, another awesome yeah. watch. Well, I, I like how, like on your video, you, you mentioned how it was your grill watch and how you likely won't use the word grill anymore. 
And I, I totally, I think for your viewers and from what I've noticed from like my deep six psychology learning from being a salesman for Rolex, <laughs> the most exciting part about getting a Rolex is the chase. It's the not having it, right? The most exciting part about, you know, um, well, a lot of those things that are hard to get is the chase. And then once you get it, you're like, holy cow, it's here. It's still just a watch. And I got it. And then you're like, okay, what's next? And that's probably what happened to you with the bash. That's what happens to me and all my customers when they get a hot watch. Okay, well, I want more now. And, and that's human nature. And that's totally fine. Yeah. But I agree with you. Like, I, I don't know that the grill watch is actually a thing. I think it's just the watch that I want really badly before I want the next watch. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe I'm speaking for other people. So No, I, I think that's a good generality. <laughs> So uh, bringing it back, Stanley, I would say, you know, from my perspective, no, I mean, I, I turned down a watch that John offered, but that's, you know, uh, not going to stop me from expressing interest in other watches from John. And, you know, if he can fulfill then I'm, I'm sure John will eventually offer me another watch at some point. And if you're being offered a white gold day date, you know, with a, a great piece, a yeah. lovely blue dial, those things aren't offered to just anybody. So, uh, yeah, I, I would say you're probably safe and <laughs> I, I wouldn't be worried about that if I were in your situation. Yep. So, Hey, Dirk just got back to us. He did uh hell's mob Moab rim King Creek backwards. Yeah. So cool. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I go down there probably three times a year in my Jeep and, uh, done hells i've done gemini bridges and i've done a couple other ones and i just love the vibe down there it's so cool maybe yeah. i can uh, yeah but yeah it, it's uh, glad you have time of year right now too oh, not it's, too so hot. it's like a different planet down there it's like mars yeah broke watch fanatic says do you see the luxury watch industry going backwards where things die down and enthusiasts can get the watches they want at any given time it's a good question um I don't, I, it kind of depends what brand we're talking here, but if we're talking the industry, I don't, I don't, I, I don't really see how with as much new interest with that, the two hot brands have, you know, the hottest brands in the world, Patek and Rolex have received over the, through the pandemic. I don't see people losing interest. I don't And I don't see these brands making more watches to meet the demand. And, um, I'll, so get all used I really to it, see basically. is, you know, <laughs> what, sorry, go ahead. I said, get used to it basically is what I said. Yeah. And honestly, like it's not, it's not, it's interesting for us, you know, for you, for everyone that wants to get a watch and it's, trust me, it's no fun for me that has to sit there all day and tell people, no, I am not, I am not in the, I'm not your enemy. I'm your friend. I want to sell these watches. Um, but we really are just doing the best we can, what we're given. And there's no hidden agenda behind that. So, yeah, I remember coming but, in one of the, I don't know, one of the days I came into the store, I sat down cause we were going to go have lunch, uh, shout out to a couple great places, downtown red iguana being one oh, of them. so good. <laughs> pretty pretty I, birds. Another great one. Pretty bird chicken. Yeah. So I sat down and I, cause you were finishing up with a client. And so I, I just sat in the waiting area and I noticed you helped that client and then you had maybe two or three walk-ins and I was within earshot. Not that I was like eavesdropping or anything, but I heard, Hey, do you have an Explorer? Hey, do you have an Explorer too? Hey, do you got a Submariner? And I just heard rapid yeah. succession people coming in and you having to go, you know, really we don't, you know, I, I, I let me take your interest and in your information, but you know, that's gotta be such a difficult thing from your perspective to get that amount. I mean, 10 minutes at your store and you, you're getting three people come in and ask for the, the watches that you don't have. It's gotta be yeah. wild. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's tough. I mean, it's at, um, most of my conversations where I'd rather than be about a specific watch and about the history of the watch and all those cool things have now turned into how hard the watch is to get. And therefore I feel like as a salesman where I really want to educate people on, on a specific watch, unfortunately get hijacked by the fact that they can't get them or that we have very long wait lists or that we're not even adding names to the wait list. I'll put you on the interest list and things like that. It's, um, you know, they leave unhappy. I'm frustrated because I, by nature, want to make people happy. And, 
and uh, I make their day. And when I'm not able to, it's uh, it wears on you for a while, you know. And and I try and be as accommodating, as friendly as I possibly can. And I hope that people see that. I try that. So um, yeah, but uh, it's just uh, kind of is the way it is for now. So shout out to Steve Schaefer. I know he's another local guy here ah. in Utah. Steve, yeah, good to, good, to, good to see him. I just saw him the other day. So one of my favorite people. Hey, here's a question. What is the best entry level watch up to 2000? I know you have a couple in your store. I have my ideas, but what would you say, John? Oh, man. I don't know that we have any in our store, Bruce, to be honest. under Isn't 1926? Isn't that like 1900? The, the Tudor, yeah, the Tudor 1926 is a great piece. Um, here, I'm the wrong guy to ask about because I – if you listen to my story coming up to this, I kind of just got dropped into like um, Rolex and Pan, right? I, I didn't go through the natural, you know, Seiko, Oris. Most people go, right? Yeah. Oris. I like Oris. I like Oris a lot. And I, are there any grand Seikos you can get? Or is that a little higher? Uh, I mean, if you no, not at 2000, unless you're buying used, you've got to, yeah. you got to be like closer to three to get a quartz. I always, I don't know. I always tell people then they have two to 3000 to spend. I just say, keep saving a little longer if you can and, and go for the, you know, one of the watches I can sell, but I don't know. That sounds bad. Honestly, get what you love. And I, I don't know. I know that, um, you know, I don't know, Bruce, that may be a better question for you. No, no worries, man. I no, I would, I would say the 1926 is great because it has a really comfortable bracelet. It's super thin, ETA movement, nice dial texture. And I believe it's under two, it's right around 2000. And yeah. then I don't think you have any stainless steel, John, but last time I was in, you did get the two tone Royal from Tudor and uh, in stainless steel, yeah. it's a, just like 23, I believe. So it's, it's yeah, just a little function. bit more. It's a great yeah. watch. And Gorgeous. We have a few. Come on in and have a look around. Cartier has a few in that two to four, I believe. Uh, IWC makes a great piece too. Um, Brightling just came out the Endurance Pro, which is a three thousand dollar watch. So I am going to get one. It uh, has their Super Quartz movement in it, and it's a sweet piece. So a Super yeah. Ocean. Too. Sweet. Hey, Chris is another local guy. He says next time I stop in, if you're there, I'll make sure to say hi. I don't know if you've met Chris yet. Uh, oh no, he, uh, yeah, because he came to the last Wings meetup that we did a couple months ago. Oh so, yeah, yeah, Chris. Yeah. I, I, because there were like three or four Chris's there that day. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I remember Chris. Yep. And I've got to shout out Design Atelier because I've been butchering your name, your channel name, awfully. And Wilson actually was like, "Hey, dude, Bruce, you're messing up big time." And I'm like, "Oh man, I totally am." So. Uh, shout out to uh, Design Atelier in Aruba, and I hope to be streaming with you soon. I know I said I'd email you. I still need to do that, cool. but we'll, we'll set together a stream. Um, so, oh, yeah, here it is. Tim, I wanted to highlight this comment. He must be extremely lucky. My AD in Seattle always has what I want as far as Rolex. I've never waited to buy a watch there. So, uh, Tim, you must be a very favorite and lucky client because you're not the you're not the norm, I think out there yeah i mean and but also it kind of depends what watches tim likes and maybe they have uh those pieces and uh but yeah chilinis chilini yeah if you love chilinis i'm sure no tim that's great for you and um yeah i think that uh, if you want to give me their number let me know and i'll call them up so <laughs> <laughs> hey let's do this one here uh then i got a couple more questions for you john yeah. but uh i'm looking to buy my first luxury watch what should i get black bay 58 Seamaster, Aquaterra, or something completely different. Let me let me tell what I think here, and then John, you can come in with any uh, suggestions you may have. But I get quite a few of these types of uh, emails from viewers, and I, I really like corresponding with uh, with other watch fans that reach out because I'm just a, a watch nut at heart. But I have a difficult time answering this type of question because it's like, hey, well, what do you like the most? Who cares what people think is a good purchase? Like. If I were to look at that, man, Aquaterra is really hard to beat as an all-arounder. Black Bay 58 is probably the hottest one out of the ones you mentioned. And if you have smaller wrists, that you know that's really hard to say no to. But I'm always like, hey, 
buy whatever the heck you like. And who cares what Bruce Williams thinks? Who cares what anybody else thinks? Go with what you feel you would enjoy the most. But that being said, you're trying to do your research and you're asking these types of questions. You're gauging opinions. So I can't fault you for that. I can just say, what would you use it for? Do you, you know, are you a pretty active lifestyle? Are you in a boardroom a lot? Are you dressing up more? Are you super casual? You know, what are you looking to do? And then I could give you some more uh, better advice, I guess you could say. But of those three, Aqua Terra is very hard to beat as an all-arounder. Time zone feature, lovely texture dial, good low light luminescence, applied markers, lovely, beautiful movement. The only thing I'm not uh, thrilled about is their butterfly clasp on the bracelet. Uh, so I would rank it Aqua Terra, then maybe Black Bay 58. I think that's great. John, you got anything else there for uh, Bari 765? No, I totally understand your question. It's a question that I've had come across. And should you have the opportunity to Obviously, Bruce mentioned the 58 is a very coveted watch right now. Um, uh, I, I, I love Tudor. I really do. Um, if I were to get a black 58, I'd probably push for the one on the bracelet. If you are offered the silver one, that's a sweet piece too. I mean, that taupe, that taupe dial is, holy cow, it's something else. Um, but other than that, the Aqua Terra is a great piece. It's a little... Uh, it's, it's not one that I would pick personally. I'd probably go with the more sportier Black Bay 58 with that rotatable bezel. I love the way the bezel turns. It's one of the crispest in the industry, in my opinion. But ultimately, I have to go with Bruce and just get what you love, man. Yeah. So. Hey, it just re you reminded me of another one that I failed to mention in that $2,000 price section. And that's just the normal Black Bay, not the diver. Uh, yeah, yeah. With the bezel, because that's right around yeah, two thousand. And the last time, yeah. And the last time I was in the store, uh, you had the new silver dial, but it, I think it was the thirty-six size. It wasn't the forty-one size. But man, Correct. that silver sunray dial looked absolutely stunning in person. Yeah, and it's, it's a. Yeah, you know, I was going to say it's, it's almost. Go ahead, please. You go ahead. Monochromatic was the word I was going to say. It's very silver throughout and it's stunning. Yeah. So I was going to say, it kind of reminds me a little bit of a Rolex Explorer just for the fact that it's, you know, it's kind of pretty, but it's a very comfortable size with large yeah. luminous, you know, hour markers. So there's no mistaking the time. It's, it's sporty yet dressy waterproof. Like it's a great all arounder in the way very an Explorer cute. would be. So that's another one that I, I failed to mention. That's right at about 2000. That's super solid. Yeah, so, uh, hey, oh, I, I got visited by my three-year-old. Got a visitor. Hey, yeah, she's a uh, mama. Wake up. mama. Okay, my my wife's taking a nap. <laughs> she's not dead. Don't worry about like it's Mother's Day. She's allowed to nap. <laughs> so, hey, go uh, go get on the iPad or something. I'll be upstairs in a few minutes. Okay. okay. All right. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> yeah. Close the door, please. So here. Hey, Okay. That would be great. Yeah. That's my youngest. She's a dream. She's a sweetheart. So, uh, Hey, this is a follow-up with Tim. I recently called to see if they had the one, two, four, zero, six, zero. So that's the no date, the 41 millimeter, uh, Submariner. And they said, co E I, uh, I don't know what that means. There. Come, come on in. I probably oh, is what he meant. To say. Oh yeah. yeah. There you got. I've only bought four watches from them in 20 years, all Rolex sports models. So, uh, yeah. So oh. we were like, Hey, what are you, what are you yeah. buying? And this is a yeah. pretty sought after watch. You had no problems in getting it. So that is great, Tim, man. That is really awesome. Congratulations. Yeah. Wear it with, wear it with pride. Yeah. Uh, big risk says Explorer is excellent, but the Longines conquest is the, is a clear contender for a $2,000 price segment. Yeah, that is a really solid watch for sure. Yeah. I really enjoy Longine. Phil and watches says I love the North flag, but it dot, got discontinued recently. Is there any way to still get it at an authorized dealer? John, I've had, what do you get? I've had a, I've had a lot of inquiries about the North flag. I reached out the tutor directly and the answer is no, unfortunately you'll have to go, uh, the gray market, but I agree with you. It's it's a beautiful piece. And I wouldn't be shocked to see something introduced down the road that would be similar. So, yeah, was that one of those ones where you you had 
in stock and you're trying to hate like the Hulk used to be, Hey, check out this watch. This is actually really yeah. awesome. And everyone's like, ah, I don't know about this. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's a good reason. That's a good way to say, just get what you love. Cause you know, it will likely pay off. I, I think all watches will appreciate all in the long run. So yeah, but yeah, the North flag, I don't remember ever had, I was, I was at the Rolex boutique. And I didn't spend much time over in the Tudor area. So yeah. Mr. French fries monster Tudor Ranger needs a comeback. I'd agree with that. I love Great. the Ranger. Yeah. I yeah. Hey, let me ask you a couple more questions here, John, if you don't mind, if you have a couple minutes, um, please, I got plenty of time. Okay. So here's two things. I know several people in the chat and we have about 200 people watching at the moment. Uh, they're not newbies by any means. They're seasoned watch collectors, been in the game for a long time. Uh, but sometimes, you know, I, I've got viewers that are really new into watches. And so uh, from your perspective, John, if someone has never been into an authorized dealer before, it can be kind of intimidating. Like, hey, I'm going to go in and I'm going to look at stuff that costs as much as, you know, some vehicles cost thousands of dollars. Uh, I, some people are apprehensive if they've never been to an authorized dealer. And from someone that works at an authorized dealer, what advice would you have for someone who's just getting into watches, maybe feels a little nervous, what would you say to them as they uh, start watch shopping? Sure. Um, that's a great question. I want those people that feel that way to know uh, that they're not wasting our time. Um, when I would work at the boutique in the mall, we'd have a lot of people that maybe normally wouldn't come into a Rolex store come in. And it was one of my favorite things was to take time and to sit and talk with them and tell them why a Rolex or why a Breitling or why a Patek is worth the, this amount of money and kind of, you know, convert them into, in, into that, into that watch. I thoroughly enjoy it. I do not. You know, and, and I know that there are some authorized dealers or high end places that may put off that vibe of don't come in. Um, we're too good for you. You're, you're wasting our time. That's unfortunate and that's on them. But I hope people feel it when, when, they, when they come into our store in Utah that, you know, we are so happy to sit and talk with them and show them watches and that they're not wasting our time. It's actually refreshing to be able to talk and, and show pieces and, and just, you know, do what I'm supposed to do, right? My job is to get people into a watch and, and to show them why um, the world of watches is so exciting. So, yeah. I hope that you don't feel that way. And I, and I really do apologize if you've ever been mistreated at like any dealer, right? Like that's super unfortunate and definitely not what any of anyone uh, wants to do, especially out here in Utah. So. Hey, and there's another question. There's, there's some people that have been in the hobby a little while. Maybe they've bought a couple uh, watches at an authorized dealer, but they've never had to do warranty work or initiate a service. Do they yeah. send it directly to the, do they come to the authorized dealer from your perspective? What do you do when you need a service or when you need hey, my, my hands not, you know, aligning properly, what do I need to do? Take us through it for, uh, for those who have not had that experience before. Yeah. Um, I guess the number one thing I would recommend is always, always, always go to a, a authorized dealer. Um, uh, OC Tanner's a plaque dealer, so we do have an in-house watchmaker, and he's one of the great, he's one of, hands down, one of the greatest watchmakers in the Western United States. Um, oftentimes, um, it can be a simple fix. I'll oh, go ahead. No, I, I've I've met him, and I've been in his clean room, like yeah. downstairs under the store. It's impressive. Yeah. He has all the tools. It's yeah. it's really cool that you, you have such a talented and uh, skilled watchmaker on the site. Not everybody yeah. does, so. I know. Um, so yeah, bring it into an authorized dealer, no, no matter what brand it is. So um, I, I would avoid going to like some unauthorized watch shop that says we can fix this watch for you. You're likely going to get parts that aren't OEM. You're going to see problems. If you do want it to get serviced by the brand down the road, they're going to notice that and they're not going to, they're going to charge you for the replacement parts. And so it's just a big headache overall, overall. Um, so bring it into an authorized dealer, uh, likely our watchmaker will service it for you, or it will be shipped off. Generally at Dallas is where a lot of watchmakers have their service centers, Dallas, New Yorkers, uh, California. Um, and, uh, I know that the time for a watch to get service is a little bit longer than normal because of the way the world's been the last year with coronavirus. Um, but, um, 
number yeah, I mean, one it could take, bring it, it back could take yeah. up six months or so depending on the brand and, and whatnot yeah yeah so just always 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 bring it to an authorized dealer that's all i'll say and then customer service will be able to assist you from there and you guys take care of the shipping the insurance right that's not out of pocket for uh, someone that's like hey i want to service this watch or is yeah. it uh it is that's a good question i don't i don't believe it is i believe it's all kind of part of the um the package and it goes out to the the brand and then they'll service it and it's usually a flat rate just you know assuming there's no other critical things in the watch that need to be done that uh, weren't quoted at time of the service but they'll always call you and get your approval before they do anything more so nice hey we got a super chat and it's it's a little uh, dicey here rr55 says john are you less likely to sell like sell to a buyer like bruce that only plans to keep a watch for a short period of time even if the interest is genuine <laughs> how do you want to tackle that one john oh man um let me start here. Yeah. So like when I bought the overseas, I had bought, let's see, I had bought a few watches uh, from John. I had bought the GMT Master II first, and then I bought the Air King about a year and a half later. And then a, almost a year after that, I bought, not quite a year, I bought the Hulk. And before I bought my overseas, I pared down my collection and I, I really went minimal. And, uh, so I let go of the GMT and the Air King, two of the three watches that John sold me. And before I did so, I'm like, hey, John, I'm, I'm probably going to sell these watches. I just wanted to give you the heads up here. And so uh, <laughs> I, that's, that's my perspective. That's, that's what's happened from my point of view. And I've also expressed interest to John in two watches, a Datejust and an OP that I had turned down from him. <laughs> the you know whenever however long ago that was and so okay i'll be up very soon okay sorry we're gonna have to end the stream here in a minute evie can you go upstairs i'll be upstairs soon okay well you can hang out here you just got to be quiet <laughs> so so anyways uh i mean i might i might get a, a watch from john in the future he's made no guarantees for me but uh, what would you add to this, John? Are you, have I been blacklisted because I say I have no keeper watches? And I have sold watches in the past after owning them for, you know, a year and a half, two years, however long. Okay. Sure. Yeah. No, I mean, ultimately, um, as an authorized dealer, we can only do what we can. Right? We can sell to our trusted uh, people that we, that we know. Uh, most people, you know, don't express in their interest to sell watches to me you know, if that's, they buy it before they buy the watch. Right. Um, ideally, you know, you keep them for a, a reasonable amount of time and what that is to you, that is to you. Right. Uh, but you know, what, what we don't want is a clear flip. That's, that's unacceptable. That puts our relationship with the brand in jeopardy and that's uh, not what the brand wants. Um, so no, so I, that's I, I mean, if, if, like... if, if, yeah, if you buy it and then in the next week you're selling it on Chrome 24, that's, that's not cool. You know, and that's, that puts my reputation at line and everyone else's. So we, we all, and, that, and that's why we have to be the way we are with, uh, with these watches. It's just the, the way it is. But. Awesome. Did I answer your question? RR 55. Hopefully we cover that. So, uh, yeah, James says, Hey, it's real fam over watch fam. That is true. That is true. I love <laughs> you guys, but I don't love you as much as my family. <laughs> oh, and You're actually still. this is kind of funny. Uh, John, I sold that air King to Dirk who absolutely loves yeah. it. And I told him, Hey, if you ever sell that, you got to sell it back to me. <laughs> so yeah. First did, right. He, he wore the air King when he was working on the Bronco and all down in Moab. He has some awesome wrist shots of it. So that's great. I, I really like I, that. Yeah. I love when guys wear their watches and throw little battle scars on them. It's yeah. the way it's supposed to be. Hey, let me do one more thing here. So we've talked about watches, the, the watch scene, your interests, your history, John, but you're also an entrepreneur. And I think this is really interesting. So let's spend a couple minutes. You just started a company called Turning Hearts and it's unlike anything I've seen before. Do you have one of those medallions handy? Yeah. I mean, it's totally not watch related, but it's one of my other passions. Um, I started a company called Turning Hearts. I have a medallion right here and it has an adhesive on the back. And, um, what it is, is you'll put this on a headstone of a, of a loved one 
And this QR code will link to a profile that you created for them on our website, turningheartstoday.com. So when I'm not selling watches, which I love, I'm just doing a little uh, side hustle on the side. And I, and I, we had a lot of interest in this and I'm super proud of it. And uh, I appreciate you letting me talk about it on your channel, Bruce. But yeah, that's what it is. Turning hearts. Yeah. So if, you, if you're at a cemetery and you see one of those little turning heart badges, you can just scan the QR code, look at a few pictures, write ups, learn a little bit about that person. That's yeah, really pictures, interesting. Pictures, videos, uh, journal entries, documents, you know, whatever the owner of that, whatever the account holder wants to put on there. And we try and facilitate. And um, it's meant a lot to a lot of people. And um, so I'd recommend giving it, giving it a try. It's really unique. So, Sorry, my, my daughters. <laughs> um, yeah, Brent says, I do with I please with my property after purchase. And I'm with you there, Brent. I'm with you. I mean, as long as you're not, uh, like John said, you buy and then, hey, what can I get? Can I get any stainless steel, stainless steel sports? And then you go you know, flip it for that five grand profit. I mean, that is frowned upon. Uh, but yeah, in Brent, my experience, I totally, you know, yeah, once, you, once you get, once you get the watch, you own the watch and you know what, that's, I totally respect that. And that's why I try and, uh, avoid that conversation as much as I can. <laughs> so, yeah, I hear that. But yeah, don't, don't make it. Yeah. That's interesting, but yeah. Well, you know what? I, I, I kind of have to cut this short. I've got a sweet girl here uh, who needs me. <laughs> I got to go be a dad, guys. But uh, I just wanted to thank you, John, for coming on and talking a little bit from the authorized dealer's perspective, what it's like, you know, you're not an enemy. You want to help customers. You want to sell watches. You want to say yes. And I think sometimes us watch enthusiasts, we can get crabby. We can go, oh, I've got a battle to try to get the watch I want. And you know, that's just not the case. There are realities with the watch market uh, that is very difficult. But uh, for the most part, there are great authorized dealers out there and they want to sell watches. And I know John is one of them. OC Tanner has always been an awesome AD in my experience. So yeah, Lexi, uh, Evie is showing off uh, a Panerai bo uh, travel tote here. So <laughs> there you go. Oh, Bruce, I really appreciate you having me on. I consider you one of my, one of my great friends. And uh it's been an absolute pleasure inviting me back anytime. And uh, thanks for everyone that watched. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, guys. And um, maybe I'll see some of you. Hang on one sec. Maybe I'll see some of you in Pennsylvania on Wednesday. Uh, be looking forward to doing that. Thanks for tuning in today and have a great rest of your Sunday.